expert, I would call myself. Uh, I studied um, IT systems engineering back in Potsdam in Germany at the Hesse Plattner Institute. Um, so IT systems engineering is basically computer science with a bit more focus on software engineering. And um, to complete this course, actually, it made sense for me to also take part in the School of Design Thinking, which is uh, a chair at the Hesse Plattner Institute, which is teaching design thinking. Now, my my story is basically the, exactly the same. I, I also studied the IT system, systems engineering and uh, design thinking, and so I'm also at SAP as a design thinking expert. And, and yeah. Okay, like every good uh, session uh, in this um, Silicon Valley, we're also starting with a little elevator pitch of design thinking. Design thinking is human-centered approach to innovation that draws from the designer's toolkit to integrate the needs of the people. Uh, the possibilities of technology and the requirements uh, for businesses uh, to success. So this has been uh, said by um, Tim Brown. I don't know how many of you know Tim Brown, but he's one of the, uh, he's the CEO of the most leading um, uh, design uh, thinking, design um, agencies uh, in the US and probably also in the world. IDEO has been uh, founded by um, David Kelly back in the um, uh, late uh, early 90s. And David Kelly is one of the professors in the Stanford University uh, just around the corner and he's giving mechanical engineering as his main class and in the 90s he um, came up with this design thinking actually so to observe the user to actually to see what people have what what needs people have he was uh, what his main goal and also to see what technology can do and how to make this also viable for for the businesses and um, with that said he um, wrote an article in 2005 about design thinking and his IDEO, his um, um, consultancy agency, which is um, giving um, clients the opportunity to, uh, to build some stuff, to, uh, to be innovative. He was writing an article about design thinking and has a platinum, the former um, CEO of SAP. Uh, he picked it up. He just saw this article and was so stunned by this article. And uh, he was talking about all the time about this design thinking and the idea to, to be creative and innovative and um, then he just founded uh, the School of Design Thinking back in, in Stanford uh, for, uh, for 25 million and uh, since then design thinking is also coming into play in SAP and is uh, playing an important role. So what is design thinking exactly? Design thinking, <coughs> design thinking means creating innovation, combining diverse people, a creative space and an uh, iterative approach. So what this means, we will um, show you um, with the next slides. So innovation is um, a combination of three fields, more or less. In this picture you see our former CEO, Jim hagelmann Snabe presenting those three fields. So the most important thing, actually, is the human being. So the human being has a desirability, which is really important. So you know the iPhone, you said that it's a really desirable product, so you have to persuade the people that they like it and th that they want it. But besides the desirability, you also have the technology part. You have to prove that your idea, your solution is feasible so that you can build it from the technology side. But besides that, you also need the money to build it, actually. So that's why you have all those three fields coming together. And if you have all those three fields on board, and um, combined in your solution and your idea, then you can create innovation actually. So if everything comes together, you have the innovation built and this is what we are all in the Silicon Valley looking for, for ideas and innovation. And um, said so that, we will let Manuel explain some more steps. Yeah, and what's really necessary for the design thinking as a whole is um, the approach um, the space and the people and starting from the people it's important that you really embrace it as a teamwork because even though there are like some creative geniuses um, it's not the norm I mean most of us are obviously not geniuses and therefore we try to find teams and the people that are willing to work as a team and that are not lonely researchers that sit in their hut and try to come up with uh, the cure for every disease in the world and 
um, we were especially looking for T-shaped people, and T-shaped people are people that are um, that have a high degree of um, knowledge or you know, skills in the vertical um, set of their personality that they have. For example, they are mathematicians or computer scientists or uh, economists or whatever, and but they also should be broad in a way that they are willing to work with other people in team or share their um, their insights or are open to um, new concepts just to be able to work as a team and use all those different um, yeah, skill sets that each team member brings to the table to come up with new solutions and bring their influence for I don't know um, to solve a certain pro uh, problem for example, we had a financial problem and we had a, uh, an actress in our team and she came up with, I mean, very, very strange um, suggestions to solve the financial problem that we had to tackle. But it turned out it was really useful to just get out of the known solutions and try to think of new ways to work with money and work with people that um, decide if such a problem, uh, project is possible at all just because she was acting quite a bit different than we as uh, physicists and uh, computer scientists did and this really helped. And since there are, there are a lot of different kinds of people in a team, it's also very important to embrace team building because you spend a lot of time with those people and a lot of time with very different people and you have to really you, know, you have to work with those people even if it's not always really fitting and then you have to try to overcome a lot of problems. And the second thing, important ingredient for the design thinking uh, as a whole is the space because it is sometimes a really wild process. It's important that you have a flexible space where you can move ideas using the post-it. I mean, a lot of people always reduce design thinking to working with post-its, but it really is an important um, factor because you can move ideas around or whole concepts just by moving some post-its and really create a different, a different space within just a couple of seconds. And the same goes with uh, the whole walls or a table because you always try to get feedback on your ideas and so you have to be able to change the space to uh, become a presentation space at any time to just use a person that you might think would be useful or whose input you might think would be useful for the project to invite him, get feedback and iterate on your idea. And that really is another core concept of not only the space, but the people that you uh, foster a feedback culture where you always try to get as much people as possible to think about your ideas, give their input and incorporate it to come up with the best solution that's possible. And you do this all with the uh, during the third ingre uh, ingredient for design thinking and that is the approach. I mean, it's all not, not rocket science, uh, science and it's nothing really new but the approach is really, to follow the approach is really what makes the difference in my, in my opinion compared to you know, <coughs> working with uh, interdisciplinary teams in, in an open space and just go wild because if you follow the process you have yeah, certain steps that you at some point really fulfill or go through and see the results coming and you start off with the problem space where you really start during understand and observe phase to go as broad as possible to diverge and get as much input on the idea as possible and then narrow it down and then come up with ideas again go broad again and then narrow it down to the best possible solution and really 
taking the time to understand the problem in the first place and then later on work on using the findings that you made during this first part of the process to come up with solutions in the second part really is very important. It's sometimes hard to just sit back and try not to come up with solutions just yet because you might otherwise yeah, jump to the conclusion far too soon. And so you first try to really understand what the problem is about and if the problem really is, or solving the problem really is useful for someone and you're not wasting your and other people's time if you just yeah, think it might be useful to tackle this and that problem later on it turns out there's no one really interested in buying your product, using it, or whatever. And after you really did research if the problem is big enough or if there really is a need to tackle the problem or whatever, you go out and observe people, you observe the users. You really, I mean, since we're coming from SAP, we can use uh, Hasso as a good example because he always wondered why is no one really burning to use his software? And turns out it's not really usable, it's a bit ugly, I'd say. And yeah, he said that the developers just lost the connection to the, the end users, and so they have to go back and watch the, the end users use the software and see where there, have, where there are problems in the software and in, in the interface and why people are preferring, for example, the uh, iOS interface to uh, the excellent SAP interface. And so in order to go out, you really have to focus on the user, try to get as much as possible insights in their their daily life, how they act with other technology where where they have no problems at all or 